and gentlemen. That's okay, don't worry, don't worry. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you, for the second time, Professor Sir Liam Donaldson. Imagine that every hospital had to have a soundtrack and maybe that soundtrack would sound something like this. But maybe that's only in a few hospitals. Maybe it would sound more like this. Uh, how would you like to be a patient entering hospital being told that the music is reflective of the quality of care in the hospital? But if we look at another industry... I think we can say that that industry fully deserves its uplifting and positive musical soundtrack. This was the front page of London's uh, single daily newspaper. It reaches a vast audience and it reported on um, a mid-air explosion involving a Qantas airline that, uh, aircraft that took off from Singapore a couple of years ago. A highly detailed uh, description went right over into the inside pages. It wasn't even a, a British flight. Um, it landed safely. No one was harmed. It was described as a near miss, and yet it was front page news. Here's a headline from Healthcare Medicine mistake nearly kills baby. So the report of a near miss in healthcare on the front page of a national newspaper. The only problem is that it's fictitious. We put that together just as an illustration. It's inconceivable that you would find the front page of a newspaper dealing with a, a near miss in healthcare like that. And even as I watch the cuttings in the UK uh, coming in every day, daily I see incidents of unsafe care and over time they're going deeper and deeper into the newspaper and the column inches for them is um, shrinking as the weeks and months go by. So I've been asked to reflect on some contemporary themes in patient safety. I had already a brief time available to do that and I'll try and catch up a little bit of time so that you're not delayed too much for lunch. But I picked out five themes really where I think there's still a lot of doubt, a lot of uncertainty uh, and a lack of clarity about the direction that we should be taking in patient safety. This gentleman um, was much loved by his family. Um, he was much loved by his colleagues around the world. He was a musician who played trumpet on the soundtrack to uh, major Hollywood movies. He was British. And he was uh, killed in hospital uh, in uh, 2010 as a result of a misplaced nasogastric tube. He was being uh, intended to be fed into his stomach, but unfortunately the tube was misplaced in his lungs. It went to a coroner's inquest, and a number of features of this case came out at the inquest, but prominent amongst them was the fact that the junior doctor who was doing the procedure was um, challenged by a, a junior nurse to confirm that the tube was in the right place, and he overruled her. And what, she, what he actually said to her, which is in the public domain through the inquest, although it sounds very shocking, when the nurse asked him for the third time whether the tube was in the correct position, he said, you don't have a brain to remember that I told you to start the feed as the tube is certainly in the right position. And a radiology and x-ray report had been filed and that flagged up the error but that went through on a routine basis and the junior doctor concerned didn't uh, actually see the report. 
So if we look at the pathology of that incident in root cause analysis terms, we can see that accounting for the cause of it is quite a complex matter. There was a degree of personal serious, personal arrogance on the part of one member of staff. He was relatively inexperienced. The standardized protocol for inserting a nasogastric tube in that hospital wasn't followed. A report, a radiology report saying the tube was misplaced was not brought into the situation in a red flag way so that everybody knew that there was a serious problem and a hazard to that patient's life. It just went through routine reporting. And most importantly, we see something which is a common feature of many um, healthcare situations and has been the cause of problems in many other industries, the presence of a hierarchy, a junior nurse, often it is a nurse, unable or seemingly unable to challenge a doctor. So that's why that patient, particular patient, died. And this whole question of how to place the arrow of accountability for harm is something which is complex and widely debated. And at one end of the spectrum is actions by the individual practitioner who may make some willful error, negligent error, and at the other end is the system. Just looking at some examples, at the system end of the spectrum you could imagine that there's relatively little individual practitioner involvement in an unsafe situation resulting from a maternity service being split across two hospital sites. Alternatively, a practitioner who ignored um, advice about risk and ploughed on and still treated the patient in the way that he or she had been intending to, you could say there the accountability of the individual is much higher and the system plays a much lesser part. But when we get to issues, uh, classical errors like the wrong injection being given, there's usually a mixture of individual and system factors. The problem is that those of us within the field of patient safety understand this very well and don't see anything remarkable about it. But the consistency in the way it's handled at the uh, level of the provider of care, public understanding and the media, very often is still dragged towards the accountability of the individual practitioner with not enough uh, attention given to the role of the system. But when we made the initial push for um, greater understanding of patient safety in the late 1990s, arguably we pushed a little bit too far in trying to make people aware of systems. Um, systems are important. The Swiss cheese, which I'm not showing today, but which you're all very familiar with, is important. But other high-risk industries also play a lot of import, place a lot of importance on highly trained, skilled, regularly rehearsed individuals. So unfinished business there, I think, in exploring the nature of accountability, both generically and in relation to individual incidents. The word culture is very widely used. We all know, we all think we know what it means. And we all think we know a pathological culture which promotes um, unsafe care. But actually, culture is a complex uh, beast and there are many strands to it. And if you were thinking about a patient safety culture, I've already given you some illustration, the need to think about systems, the need for it to be non-hierarchical and so on. I haven't said very much about data, but having a culture where people uh, regularly use data to assess their performance for uh, identifying areas of risk, for comparing themselves to others is also very important. But there can be more subtle um, influence as well. And I thought I'd give you this next example from a field unrelated to healthcare, just to illustrate the point I was making earlier about hierarchy and how it manifests itself in um, 
a more complex situation which actually boiled down to some very simple principles. Now, if I gave you a choice between watching a PowerPoint presentation or reading a detailed technical guide, you would all almost certainly opt for the PowerPoint. I certainly would. But in fact, when this space shuttle, the Columbia Space Shuttle, came to its end in 2003, a PowerPoint presentation had a lot to do with what brought it down. And this was beautifully unpacked in a, an analysis by um, Edward Tuft, who many of you will know is, uh, has written some superb books on presentation of data, particularly numerical data. But in this particular occasion, he was making a point about um, quality, qualitative data. And what happened in this um, tragedy is that something just after takeoff of the shuttle hit the fuselage of the shuttle. But there was very little, little video evidence for the um, NASA officials to assess the risk of re-entry. So essentially they spent um, about a 12-day period debating what should be done to uh, intervene to try and mitigate any risks that might arise from uh, the shuttle re-entering and to the astronauts as a result. And many of the debates were, took place with PowerPoint presentations, and this is an actual PowerPoint provided by the Boeing engineers to the senior hierarchy of NASA as part of the decision-making process. There were over 20 PowerPoint presentations made as they deliberated. And it, Tuft's analysis of this, and I haven't time to go into all the detail of it, but essentially he um, makes the point that the hierarchy of the PowerPoint presentation and the culture of the organization conspired to play a big part in this disaster. If you look, for example, at the heading, um, and admittedly the whole thing is very jargonistic and, and busy as a slide, but the, um, the word conservatism is used. In other words, that they don't actually know what happened. They know that something broke off and hit the fuselage, but they don't know whether it did any damage. So they're saying conservative, which is, is the, the term that they were using for reassuring. And the bigger bullet points at the beginning and the use of the word significantly are also giving reassuring messages. And it's only when you come down to the, um, the lower bullet points, which are much lower in the hierarchy, that you see phrases like minor va variations in total energy can cause significant tile damage. So there, the engineers were actually warning that really this could be very serious, but the fact that it appeared in the fifth of six uh, hierarchies in the PowerPoint format meant that much more attention was given to the heading and the bigger PowerPoint uh, bullet points, which were reassuring. So the Columbia Accident Investigation Board found that technical reports were actually better than PowerPoint for the communication of complex risk. And this, this identifies, this example I think illustrates a number of um, themes in the interpretation of situations. There was bias there. There was an inappropriate use of acronyms. We know that acronyms in healthcare kill patients. There were ill-defined terms. Those can also be dangerous in healthcare. There was inappropriate data modeling. One of the bullet points on that slide um, gave a rather obscure set of um, numerical information about the uh, model. But in fact, what it meant was that the model that had been used to assess the risk, um, the real impact uh, factor was 600 times greater than the one used in the model. And so Tuft argues that really at that point, 
the bullet point should have said review of test data indicates the irrelevance of the data model and then the whole question of presentation of information is also relevant to healthcare. So let me move on to my third reflection. Should it be a professional duty to improve quality and safety? Well, one of the classic areas for error in medical care is the um, occurrence of wrong site surgery. Two examples here. In Addenbrooke's uh, Hospital in Cambridge in, in the United Kingdom, over a six-week period, these uh, four errors occurred in only six weeks, a retained swab, a retained instrument, wrong site surgery, and a wrong implant put, being put in. Across the other side of the world in 2007, Rhode Island Hospital, which is affiliated to uh, Brown uh, University, uh, an Ivy League university, had three incidents in only one year in a very narrow field of surgery, neurosurgery. One operation went awry after an experienced brain surgeon insisted to a nurse that he knew what side of the head to operate on, but he got it wrong. Another time a doctor in training cut into the wrong side of a patient's head after skipping a pre-operative checklist. And in a third case, the chief resident started brain surgery in the wrong place and the nurse didn't feel able to stop him. So one of the pieces of work that we've done in the WHO program which I'm involved in is the establishment of a surgical checklist. And this has um, been pioneered by um, Dr. Atul Gwandi of Harvard University who's done brilliant work in bringing this into existence and also um, into common use around the world. Some of the early results were, um, although people were skeptical about the small scale of the study, were very, very encouraging. And later, a later, much larger study from uh, Holland led to this conclusion by the uh, New, England uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Checklists are not the final step towards optimizing surgical quality, but they seem to have crossed the threshold from good idea to standard of care. But there are some problems in a minority of cases. As I travel around, not just in the UK but elsewhere, and ask people that I meet in hospitals, how's the checklist going? On the whole, they're enthusiastic. But underneath, a number of people tell me that there are problems with the cooperation of senior surgeons. In one example, I was told about fairly recently, that the surgeon didn't want to participate in the checklist because he regarded it as childish and unnecessary, his words. But the checklist will only be effective if the whole team, and particularly the team leader, is involved in the process. And we know that teams are important in medicine. This, I tore this out of a magazine I read one day at an airport a few years ago. I've lost the original magazine, but I thought it was very striking. These are the number of people involved in a cardiothoracic bypass operation, a huge number of people ranging from porters to technicians to the anaesthetist and then the surgeon who actually does the procedure. So if those teams aren't bound together and a checklist is one of the ways of doing that, then the care becomes dysfunctional and even hazardous to the patient. But I wanted to just make one final point about this series of examples. And that is, when does it become a professional duty to participate in a standardized procedure which can save lives and prevent harm? And when does it become unprofessional not to do so? Because at the moment, there is great leadership from many of the professional bodies around the world in helping us to introduce measures like the checklist, but they're much more reluctant to take on their members who don't want to participate or uh, are uncooperative in some way. And this alienation from looking after the welfare of their patients, I think, is a, is a serious problem, even though it's in a minority of cases. And of course it will take time to get everybody on board, but we need to be tackling some of these difficult areas and challenging them. 
How do we define effective solutions? Well, there are a number of interventions, and here are some of them, for uh, intervening to reduce risk. Training and simulation is one. Standardizing process. Checklists, which are not quite the same thing as standardizing uh, process. Good practice guidance, which is probably the most commonly used method. And um, technological uh, redesign uh, solutions. Some years ago, I, I wrote an editorial for the um, Lancet, which came about from a, a bit of reflection I did when I was in my bath, surrounded in, uh, with bath bubbles, and, and my ducks is a good place to, sing, to think. And um, I imagined a Boeing 757 aircraft somewhere on the runway, somewhere in the world, and I imagined an engineer going to do a pre-flight inspection and finding that one of the wires had come apart from its housing and I imagined it was an orange colored, very distinctive colored wire. And I wondered what would happen next. Well, of course he would fix it so the flight could take off. But also, I think it's highly likely he would have reported up the line to his supervisor and then there would have been a concern about all engines of that type in the world in case this was a systematic and not um, a localized um, problem and we've seen many times uh, those sorts of inspections occur over 36 hours to uh, look at every similar engine in the world. Why do they do that? They do it to keep us air passengers safe and I asked the question in this short editorial when will healthcare pass the orange wire test? knowing as we do that sometimes information doesn't even transmit about safety and learning from uh, risk through the corridors of the same hospital, let alone to another town or city or right across the world. And one of the frustrating things about um, the present situation uh, is that we don't have a reliable way of extracting value, learning value from uh, patient safety incident reports. We're doing much better at it, but the, the organization that I chair, part-time chair of at the moment, the National Patient Safety Agency in England, we now have seven million incident reports that have been accumulated over time. So we're pleased at the level of reporting, but we're less pleased with our ability to mine very big data sets to produce um, information of value. One of the um, most successful measures was actually a very simple one where we identified that there was harm arising from people arriving late to, uh, in, in response to crash port calls of people who'd had cardiac arrests and respiratory arrests. And we found that in the National Health Service there were many different crash call numbers available. Uh, and we standardized quickly onto one uh, single number for all hospitals and made it policy. So that's probably the, one of the few examples I can think of where we've extracted value from the, something that we picked up through the incident reports, acted on it, and it immediately made a difference to reduce uh, risk. And we need many more of those. The na nasogastric tube example I gave you earlier, it's still happening. It's still causing harm despite all the alerts and guidance that have been put out uh, to try in the United Kingdom to try and minimize it. The problem is still there. And there are too many problems like this in patient safety where we have the data telling us what happened but, and we put solutions in place, but the solutions don't work. So this connection um, this uneven flow from uh, analysis to action I think is one of the current dilemmas in patient safety and it really needs to be addressed. And the comment I'd make on it is that we need to think harder about what goes in between, what connects the analysis to effective action because very often um, a lot of the uh, interventions that are put in place are based on common sense or what seems to be the right thing to do and it's important in a field like this that we find the right balance between creativity thinking what how you would try to get round a problem 
and using what evidence there is. Now, there is not a great deal of evidence on um, interventions in, uh, to reduce risk, but, but there is a body of evidence, and there have been relatively few systematic reviews carried out to, to bring it together. But it does still need this um, element of problem solving and creativity. So finding a balance between the two, I think, is, is vitally important. And then my final point, really, and one which I've really tried to major on th throughout my career in the UK, but also in the World Health Organization, is how we can truly involve patients and families in the quest for safer care. And one of the things I've found as I've gone around the world with the World Health Organization is how many family members, often who've suffered serious loss or tragedy um, as a result of unsafe care, have been able to rise above that tragedy to help us um, to take forward this um, commitment to producing safer care. And I remember one conversation in particular that I had in Canada of a woman whose child had died due to a series of uh, failures in, in uh, the safety of his care. And she said to me, well, they wanted to put a memorial in the hospital. Um, and I said to them, I don't want you to put a plaque on the wall. I don't want you to plant a tree in the hospital garden. The memorial I want to my son is to show me that you can learn. And I think that lesson and that message is really one that we all need to, be heart, to take to heart. We're doing this for our patients and we need to be better and quicker at solving some of the problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liam, for that very inspiring call to arms. I now invite you to have lunch, do some networking, and have a great afternoon.